No? Leave that one alone? Okay, I will. Uh, ball. Ball's there. Am I the only, I bought everybody, I emailed everybody drinks. Did everybody get drinks for our happy hour tonight? <laughs> no. I'm sorry, guys. There you go. Julie's drinking tea. Let's see. We got Sandy on. We got Rob. Uh, some new people. Look at that. Oh, wow. Got some military on. Um, let's see. Who else is on? You got the only reason we have this many people is because James is on. You guys wouldn't have shown up on a Tuesday night one week after voting if uh, James wasn't on. Let's see who else is on here before we get started. Greg, I know you. Ed, had a lot of back and forth with Ed. Lana's on. That's exciting. I haven't had Lana, seen Lana in a while. So, James, how's Austin? James is muted. Jeff, don't mute James, please. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. How's Austin, man? Austin is doing awesome. Have you ever been to um, a place called uh, Leander? Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. I know there's some, some, someone from Dallas uh, also doing a big project over there. <laughs> some little mud puddle in the middle of uh, dirt and, uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah, um, it's very interesting. We're not talking about that tonight, but it's very interesting um, what goes into a development. Uh, the uh, shadow study that we paid for is fascinating to see where you're going to put a nine story hotel that over that kind of shadows a lagoon so that it doesn't shadow the lagoon in during the summer solstice, but is okay to shadow during the winter solstice. It's unbelievable. Um, quite honestly, the money that goes into setting up a PUD. Uh, Jeff and I have been watching that today. It was very interesting. We had an hour conversation on a hyd hydrologist. For those of you besides Alan Stewart that don't know what a hydrologist is, I'm, I'm picking on Alan because he's an Aggie and I'm sure he knows what a hydrologist is. And his team is number seven in uh, college football in a year where nobody plays, but I'm going to give him credit for that. <laughs> I got you, man. No, they're actually, look, Aggies are looking good this year. Um, but yeah, so a hydrologist, because we have, I think, three people in the city of Leander that are contesting the amount of water we are going to use for our lagoon because they've been on kind of water rationing for the last three years. So we had a hydrologist estimate the amount of water, the amount of rainfall. Uh, Jeff, I'm not mistaken, I think it evaporates 20.8 gallons an hour um, on four acres and how to replenish it. Unbelievable what goes yeah, into Yeah, who, who knew? We learn something new every day. Unbelievable. Um, and we do, because it is outside of Austin and the Austin MSA, we apparently have to uh, transplant a, an ancient version of a, a spider where there are three left in the world. So we have to move our lagoon over 12 feet so that the spider can continue to grow and grow and populate. Um, I think her name is Charlotte. Anyway, uh, enough about that. So guys, uh, I'm going to shrink my screen a little bit and I'm going to introduce you to the man of the hour. Um, no, it's not me. Let's see. Speaker view. Okay. So I have, uh, I have the pleasure of, I mean, you guys know that it's Callister and Associates and the title company, Axiom Title. We put on these happy hours every, uh, it used to be once a month, um, and we, it would cost us about $2,500. So COVID came, and now it's about every couple of weeks, and it costs me about uh, $90 a month. So yay for COVID. Uh, but um, so we are uh, putting this on, and you guys know that I rarely will have anybody speak uh, besides myself and my team. Um, so Julie up there is smiling because she's one of the other only people I've had speak because she's full of incredible information. And I think uh, Julie and I uh, uh, do well together. By the way, she only had to speak for an hour on mine. I think she held me for two hours and 15 minutes on hers. So um, she owes me another hour back on our, our uh, happy hour. But um, I wanted to introduce you guys to James Kandasami. I've known him for quite a while. Uh, he's a, I'm gonna say he's a Longhorn because he lives in Austin. If he's not, just don't tell Alan Stewart. Um, but uh, James is a client, a friend, and um, kind of a, a, I don't know what the right word, confidant or, um, kind of, uh, we, we, we kind of brainstorm, kind of mastermind about uh, plans and fund of funds and 
other interesting things. Um, very, he's got very unique mindset. Um, and I, I really enjoy kind of figuring out how he's looking at things. We actually look at things very similar when it comes to structuring deals. Um, you know, how do you create win-win situations for everybody? Uh, James has been very successful in Austin. He is a, he's got his own book. Um, I read it when it first came out and I believe James, you said you were going to, um, offer everybody a, a free copy. Uh, as you guys know, at the end of the show, it's recorded. Uh, Jeff has to do his little magic tricks with it, Jeff and Rob, and then we will, uh, send it out tomorrow morning with a copy of the PowerPoint. I think James is going to put a link to his book. I highly recommend reading. It's very interesting. Um, not as interesting as what you're about to hear from James, but is James unmuted, Jeff? Yeah, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? So, yeah, James, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll uh, sure, open sure, up the sure. screen. Well, you're saying about the, uh, that you know me for some time and I just remembered that um, I think 2013 is when I bought my first house, you gave me the first hard money loan and <laughs> we didn't okay. even know that until like two months ago. Yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> I was, was saying, I, I, I was the Longhorn uh, hard money guy. And I was like, oh, really? Okay, that was my first house, right? <laughs> That's funny. Wow. <laughs> I only realized it like two months ago that, you know, you were behind that, right? So have you paid me in full yet? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. Good. And we also caught somebody trying to do a fraud, right? Remember? I, I oh, remember. yeah. Actually, you know what? I do remember that. Yeah, because somebody yeah. was like trying to, you know, take my email and send to you and ask you for money. You know, you're trying. I mean, that was like maybe like fifth or sixth house at that time. Yeah, I think it was Greg that did that. Greg? He took your email and then asked for a raise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, James, tell us yeah. um, tell yeah. us about what, you, what, what you're doing in multifamily and... Um, what you're expanding to, and then we'll um, I'll put up the screen and we'll start talking about. Uh, sure, deal sure, sure, sure. So I'm a multifamily uh, deal sponsor or syndicator, where we put money together and buy apartment complexes. Right, we focus a lot on Class B and C. I mean, right now more Class B, focusing a lot in uh, Austin and San Antonio market. Right now, owning 2,000 units. Yesterday, I think yesterday we closed our um, 10th acquisition, 263 units, which is, uh, I call it a COVID, COVID deal, the first COVID deal, right? So, congrats, man. <laughs> thanks. thanks. I heard you had a really hard time raising capital under one of your structures. Oh, no, no, no. It was like, like we, we raced it in five hours. hours. Yeah. Five hours. Maybe five three hours. hours because after that becomes a sleeping time, right? So, the next, right. I counted 12 hours to raise the whole thing, but only five hour waking up time, right? By the time, by the time I'm awake, I'm done, right? So most people count days or weeks. You count sleeping hours versus waking hours. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're going to talk about that structure on, on how did we do it and why is it so interesting for a lot of people and how did I change my structure because I was always stuck on one structure. And when I wrote my book uh, and two years ago, I was looking at a lot of research about different structure and making sure that I can explain it as... Um, what you call as independent as possible, right? Without any bias on structures, right? Because syndication structures are very uh, personal and everybody have their own uh, thought process on how it should be done. And, uh, you know, we want to go through that uh, uh, in a short while. But I wrote a lot about this uh, two years ago in my book when I launched my book, like uh, I think one and a half years ago is when it was, it came out. But two years ago, I was already, you know, writing about, you know, the different structures. So, so about myself, uh, as I mentioned, focusing on Austin, San Antonio, more than 130 million asset under management. Now it's probably like 165 or something like that. 2,000 units, 10 apartment complex, um, raised almost $50 million. Uh, single GP, We only my wife and I, there's no other GP in our deals. And, and I, of course, I have a key principle, like you know, some people that you know, like John Montero, who helped me with the, with the balance sheet and loan as well. And he gives a lot of really good advice as well. So... Um, we are vertically integrated. We have our own asset management, construction, and property management ourselves. So we have like 40 staff working for us. Maybe now it's like around 45 with the new acquisition. Um, we also, I'm also author of the best-selling book and uh, sold 2,000 paid copies. Not the free one. I'm not even counting the free ones. This is paid copies. People are just buying it in Amazon. Uh, it's $20 in Amazon, and you can buy in an Audible, in a physical copy, or even Kindle version as well. Um, I also have my own podcast, uh, uh, which is called Achieve Wealth Podcast, Achieve Wealth Through Value at Real Estate Investing Podcast, um, or also Facebook group, which is like 7,000 people in the past, uh, maybe one and a half year, maybe, maybe two years, I can't remember, but you know, 7,000 in two years is, 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 is awesome, right? And I also have my own mentoring program, a small one, not a big one, but 
but uh, I do have students uh, who are learning on the details of uh, syndication, raising money, property management, and asset management as well. So let's go to the next one. Oops, did I hit the next one? That was an accident. Yeah, in yeah, yeah, correct, correct. So, so James, you and, I, um, you and I have talked about this. Actually, we talked about this several months ago. Oh, yeah. About kind of the optimum deals and, and basically, I mean, you already know we're syndication lawyers and about 80% of our deals all look the exact same. They're all structured the exact same way. Mm -hmm. And especially if you look right now, everybody's got a deal. Everybody's trying to raise capital. It's the fourth quarter and nothing happened in Q2 or Q3. So everything is being compressed into Q4 and there's lots of deals out there. And so you and I have talked about kind of these win-win type structures. And it was interesting because you're the first person I've talked to in, it's going to sound, I'm going to say this the wrong way and don't take it the wrong way, but in the mom and pop uh, aggregation of multifamily. I only mean that because as a corporate lawyer who was formerly a, a bankruptcy and workout lawyer, I dealt with the large private equity funds and the structures look nothing like this. And so you and I had some interesting discussions about three or four months ago, and you were introducing structures that were very familiar to me several years back. And those are the structures I like, but part of the issue is you've got to, you've got to almost train some of the people out there that you want to bring into your deals, how to understand these and why they're actually better than some of the existing structures, because it puts you and the LPs on the same playing level. And it's almost like we have to tell them today why they want to like these type of structures. It's still good for the GPs, but the GPs have to perform in order for them to make money. So what you could go ahead and kind of, uh, start this slide off. I just want to give a little intro. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think a few months back when we were under COVID, I was trying to set up a distress fund and I was really trying to figure out how do I make a structure which is very, very uh, good for the fund on the sponsor side. And also I want to make sure the passive investors are taken care of, right? Because that's how a fund would, would fly, right? Because a fund, when you don't have a deal, you, know, you have to really sell the story of the fund, right? So when we were trying to look at that, and I think uh, me and Meryl were like trying to brainstorm, what's the best structure here for everyone, right? Um, I mean, of course I ended up, I didn't create that fund. I, I went it with the single purpose entity uh, deals, but that puts a lot of thought process. And recently I did a deal, which, uh, you know, after a lot of thought process, because I've been always doing one structure for my entire Korea, right? Until recently, right? Where I changed and put a lot of thought process into it, put a lot of pro and cons and, and I came up with a really good structure. Uh, but, you know, as I said, structure is a structure and we're going to discuss about it. You know, uh, you want to really see how it's benefit the passive investors, you know, how it's going to motivate active investors. So, so in my mind, when I was doing this research for the past, uh, what, four or five months on what's the best structure moving forward, how can I really, um, you know, first of all, convince the passive investors at the same time, convince myself that I am going to be motivated to do this kind of difficult deals, right? If it's, if the structure is not very motivating for the sponsor, I'm not going to do it because what's the point, right? We work, I mean, I can right. be like a normal person, like everyone just do the normal structure. Everybody knows about it. Everybody, nobody talks about it, but, but I don't want to do that. I want to do really good deals at the same time, make a lot of money for, for investors, make a lot of money for the sponsors. And everybody be happy, but what is that structure, right? So, so in my mind, I come up with these three most important component on a good deal structure, right? So good deal structure, you have to be a win-win between the general partners and also the uh, limited partners. And this structure, because I don't want to keep on changing structure because then, you know, then you, you know, you are, you are giving a lot of different, um, you know, thought process to different people doing different deals. What I say is, okay, this structure need to be really good structure during all economic cycles, during the up, up cycle, during the down cycle. And also it should take care of any deal performance of the sponsor, right? All of the deal, right? So deal, if it deals doing very well or deals not doing very well, it should be you know, able to take care of the passive investors very well because passive investors are the one that enabling uh, you know, GPs to really do the deal. And I wanna make sure that we really take care of them, right? Second of all, uh, the second point is basically we want the structure to motivate the sponsor to push for the deal performance, right? You know, if you're doing a deal, which is, if, if a structure is very, very monotonous, very, very single motivation level uh, structure, then there's no, uh, there's no uh, real motivation for the sponsors to push, 
right? Uh, and and you know this is something that passive investors need to understand. If they really want to maximize their investment, the structure need to be optimized for the sponsors as well to perform in certain ways while taking care of their fundamental expectation of a deal, right? So. So that's why, you know, second thing is we need to motivate uh, sponsors. The third one is it also need, the structure need to be able to address a variety of investor uh, preference, right? Uh, a variety of investors, uh, you know, um, expectation, right? So I, when I wrote my book, if you look at chapter three, when we talk about considering deals, you know, everybody have different expectations. Some people have, you know, I want cash flow. As some people said, I want an equity multiple because I want to multiply as much equity as possible when I'm, I'm when I when I really want to retire. That's why I want cash flow. So, so we want to do. You know, how do I create a structure which address that? Right. So, let's go to the next slide. So what you're saying is the. I'll mm -hmm. go to a second. So, and, and and I try to do these as well. We've talked about this. So mm -hmm. you're wanting to create a structure that captures the the largest group of investors, knowing that. You can have four investors and each one of the four investors have different risk levels, different goals. There are different points of different points in their lives where, you know, like someone like my dad is used to bonds, which now are garbage. But in the old days, he would want a bond that just paid a coupon. Correct. And you and I have talked about this and I've got it in one of my current structures and you've got it where mm -hmm. you're essentially paying a coupon. And it's interesting. There are quite a few people out there that want a coupon. And you're about to go into this, but the reality is you're you're decreasing the cost of your capital by offering the coupon. At the same time, you're offering an investor an opportunity to get into this with very very minimal risk. Um, oh, it's a great idea. Yeah, yeah, and also, I mean, you have to understand people when they let's say you have two hundred, three hundred thousand to invest, right? If you're young, if you invest in three cash flowing deals, you are done, right? For one year, you're done. For you have to you have to accumulate for another few more years to accumulate that money to do it right but if you invest that in a you know uh, in a deep value add you can multiply that money keep on multiplying right so so everybody have different options when when it comes to what where are they in their investment cycle and how much money they they have uh, to invest and what are they looking for are they looking for cash flow or are they looking for um, you know equity multiples right so so two major structure that a lot of people are aware of in fact I, I wrote it in my book like you know two years ago as well because that's what I know I mean this is very high level, there's a straight split, 70-30 or 80-20. Or in the second uh, major structure is a preferred return structure, right? So we're going to go through that in a, in a short while on you know, what, are the, what are the pro and cons of each one of these and, and we'll discuss, right? So um, next slide, please. So on a straight split, I think a lot of people are aware, a straight split is very, very easy to understand. Um, you know, people like it because it's easy to understand. You can take anyone from the road and say, hey, I share, you know, 50-50 or I share 80-20 or 30-70-30. Anybody can understand, right? So, so it's very easy to understand. Um, and also, you know, there's a lot of arguments saying that this is alignment of interest. You make money, I make money. You make money, I make money, right? We just share, right? So, so yeah, I would say that, yeah, there is alignment of interest between GP and LP. Um, but there's, a, there's also a, a, a cons to it too, right? The pro is easy to understand alignment of interest. Um, and I'm going to go through a few more things as well. But the cons to it is like also this, you know, whatever straight split is, you know, you have to really read the company agreement and understand the structure. Otherwise, you can go into different interpretation or manipulations, right? So the problem is not many people are very well versed in looking at the company agreement and understanding the structure, right? So, so for example, first of all, uh, when they talk about 80-20, what does it mean? Does it mean carried interests or does it mean equity split? Right, so let me tell you what's the difference. Right, carried interest means it's 80 20 on the profit that's being made. Let's say you, you have a hundred thousand, so carried interest means let's say you, the, the deal become hundred thousand to hundred twenty thousand. So the eight twenty thousand is where you take that 80 20 split, right? But they are also 80 20 split where they say, I give you hundred thousand, 80 thousand is yours, 20 thousand is mine on day one, right? That's also 80 20, right? But so if you say it very quick, things can change, right? So and, and you'll be surprised on how many structures are out there which have an equity split. But when I explain it very well in a simple manner, people say, oh, I wouldn't invest in that. But I can tell you one thing. Go back and read your company agreement. And see what did you right. invest? <laughs> right? you, should have a lawyer. you should have a lawyer read your company agreement. Yeah, correct, correct, correct. So it, it, it's, it's, you know, there's another way of uh, uh, you know, interpretation of 80-20, right? Sometimes people say very quickly, oh, I do 80-20, 80-20, 80-20, but the 80% can be for the GP, 
Right. right? I mean, right. yeah, you, you think it doesn't happen, you'll be surprised oh, yeah. on how much within our network it does happen. Yeah. It's just people yep. don't read the company agreement. Yep. Yeah. So, I was looking. Go yeah, ahead, go ahead uh, I was going to say, so tell us about equity split uh, from day one. You talked about that. Mm -hmm. what, is a, what is a swap sharing? Tell me about that. Uh, swap sharing, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Sometimes when people say 80 20, 80 20, I mean, it's, it's a general understanding that 80% goes to LP and 20% is the GP. But the other day, I was looking at a company agreement from you know somebody within our network. Uh, that person is doing 70 30, but 70% is going to the GP, 30% is going to the LP, right? So, yeah. well, I mean, if people know how I explain it, I mean, that's a bad, that's a bad deal for passives, right? But, you know, when you do a straight split, it's very difficult to really understand unless you go and read the company agreement. Right? So James, so, are, you, are you telling me that my last helium deal that I raised capital for, which was a 60, 40 split, 60 for the GP, 40 for the LPs is a bad deal? <laughs> Good deal for the GP, but bad but, deal for the passive. Yeah, it, I, I would argue for multifamily, absolutely. For other things like oil and gas, they're all oh, oil and gas. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not aware of all that. Yes. Yeah. So it's interesting. So they're very heavily weighted towards the other end because mm -hmm. the return, if you hit, it's always a big if, but if you hit, you know, you're talking five, 10, 15 times multiple on your money. Even at a 40, even at a 60 40 split, 60 going to the GP for the LP. But Got it. with high reward, there's very high risk. So the odds of hitting some of these are, you know, one in 10, one in 100. But you don't have the same risk with multifamily. It doesn't go to zero. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah, I'm talking about, about the general multifamily that right. everybody thinks that they understand the structure, but, you know, they want to go back and read and and see whether they really know so, what, what structure did they invest in. So the next one is very important. I think we should spend a, a couple minutes on operational cash flow. Sure, so sure. there is a big discussion because people don't understand the return of capital versus the return on capital. It's not that they don't understand it. They don't understand how it affects them when there's a payout on a sale because they're thinking they're gonna get a certain percent of the return based on how much they invested but in reality, they may have been in, under a return of capital structure. So there's a different payout based on how your documents read. You want to go into that? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. This is very interesting because I think it's one of the very, very subtle, uh, you know, <laughs> it's just between on and off, right? So One letter, right? One, one letter. letter change and that becomes different, right? So, so let me explain very high level, right? In, in the investment world, there's two worlds, right? One is called the tax world and the other one's called investment world. In the tax world, whatever whatever distribution, whether it's return on capital or off capital, is always considered as return off capital. capital. So, so that's on the tax world, right? Taxable, right? So, so we, we want to put that aside. But on the investment world, so let's say I'm not talking about refinances or sale, right? I'm talking about operational uh, cash flow from the real estate. So let's say you're putting in 100,000 and you're getting 10,000. What that 10,000 is, is that interest or is that your own money, right? So it is your own money if it's written off capital and if it's interest, it's written on capital, right? So any investment, you always want to make sure it's written on your capital, right? I mean, you, you cannot go and put a CD for 100,000 and get, you know, part of your, the CD, let's say, let's say they said 5% CD interest rate. They can't be like taking from that 100,000 and giving you back saying that hey, this is your 5%, right? They should need to create 5% on top of that 100,000, right? So... So just because of that, when you when you do a return of capital as part of your uh, uh, return, when you say 80-20, that 80-20 automatically becomes 70-30 or 60-40. And the way it happens is because the money is being returned throughout the operation, at the sale, your basis have already been diluted, right? You've already been reduced. So let's say you put 100,000. For five years, you get 10,000, 10,000, 10,000. For five years, at the sale... The sponsor just need to give back another 50,000, right? They, he don't have to give back 100,000, right? But on a return on capital, that 100,000 is preserved until the end, right? So when preserved until the end, all the money you make during the operation side is all profit, right? Whereas on return of capital, you are not making any money for the next five years, right? Let's say you, it's a five year horizon, you're making zero money, all your risk is at the sale, right? So it's a very, very high risk in my mind. When you do return of capital, uh, it's, cash it's, it's good it's for the GP because the GP now the GP only has to satisfy in your example fifty grand, and then the GP starts splitting. There's seventy mm -hmm. thirty split, 
So it's much, it's to a much greater benefit to the GP. So, you know, when you're getting into these deals, you want to ask those questions, you know, are you treating this as a return of capital or return on capital to your, your sponsor? Because it is, there's a huge difference. Oh, well, it's a huge, always, huge difference. Can be, yeah. I mean, you're talking about monetary terms. I'm on top of monetary is also risk, right? I mean, if you're not making money for five years, you're actually losing money, right? I mean, because inflation eats your money, right? And, and the whole thing is contingent upon whether you're going to make money at the sale because you're not making money during operation, right? So, so go back and read your company agreement, see whether you're getting back capital or you're getting back profit doing operation. And yours are return of or on? On, on of course, on, on capital, yeah. So are ours, so are ours. Yeah, yeah. We, we always make sure that the uh, investors' money are preserved until the end. And only at the end when we give back their investors. And then on top of that is where we do any splits. Right. Now, a couple of, a couple of deals I've done in the past, they are return of capital. But we made it very clear to the investors up front that we are treating this as a return of capital, um, but gave a very high pref on it mm -hmm. to help compensate for that. But you're absolutely right. You need to, because there's so many different ways to structure deals and the difference between two consonants um, are incredible uh, of and on. I, I, I posted something like uh, two or three weeks ago um, on COVID and uh, it was just a, it was kind of a thing where, hey guys, it's very interesting. The CDC decided to count COVID deaths as from COVID and now it's with COVID. There's a big difference dying from something and dying with something. A motorcycle crash, you die, but you had COVID when you tested. That means you died with COVID and they're counting that as a COVID death. Before they were telling everybody you were dying from COVID. So again, prepositions, you learn this in law school, change the meanings of just about everything and, and of and on um, uh, are huge here. So yeah. So the last- And 90% of the deal are written on capital. Uh, very, very few people are doing written of capital. Deals. Right, right, right. A, a smart passive investor would catch it very quickly. Right. Were well, you saying I'm not smart? <laughs> No, you know, of course you know that, right? So, uh, so the last one here is the motivation for sponsor. Yeah, basic motivation for sponsor, right? So as I said before this, right? I said there need to be some motivation for the sponsor to you know push the performance, right? Because they are making money on the upside of whatever they started with, right? So if they, you know, if 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 it's like a straight split 80-20, there is no real, you know, what what you're already flat 20%, right? So you're just gonna let it flow for the next uh, five years. And, you know, you're going to do keep on going for another deal rather than let me look at, let me look, see whether I can squeeze more NOI here. Let me do something more creative here, which is going to be a win-win for the sponsor. And also the, the passive is going to win too. Right. So, so yeah, straight splits are very, very fundamental motivation, which is basically, you know, um, you know, just normal motivation. Right. So right. It's like 85% of the deals you and I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Correct. So, so what, on a prefer what's a preferred return? So preferred return means investors get paid first, right? So any cash flow that comes from the deal, investors get preferred return. So, so if, and if they don't get paid, usually it accrues to the next year, right? So that's 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 the meaning that I know on preferred return, unless you have other things. But that's what I, I see, right? But, yeah, but so the you, thing is, when you say accrue, do you mean like a catch up next year? Catch up, catch up. Yeah, so they're not going to lose. Yeah, so if the property doesn't perform as expected the first year, and let's say they have an 8% prep and only get six, that means no one else is getting paid. They're gonna get the first two next year to catch them up and then their eight starts all over again. Yes. Correct. That's important for people to know because they don't, a lot, of, a lot of people that are listening don't do deals that have prefs and those are good deals or- Prep, prep returns, I mean, it's, yeah. it's crazy. I mean, as I said, I was like, really figuring out what is the best way to do a really good deal because I like to do deep value add value add deals which doesn't cash flow very well in the beginning right because we are going around turn around but how do I compete with another guy who's giving a very high cash flow because sometimes people say that oh that guy is better because he's giving me 8% cash flow but here I'm doing a very difficult deal which is going to pay a lot more once the, the whole uh, repositioning is done and when we sell because we are bringing up equity right we have equity multiple right so how do I do that? So then I was thinking, okay, if I give a pref, that means I'm promising you every right. year, I'm going to give a pref return and I'm going to catch up. That's going to be a really, really compelling uh, uh, argument for any passive investors. People love that, especially right now, COVID, right? How many deals are not paying? 
right. on a straight split, right. that's nothing, right? If the sponsor stop, you stop. Right. But on a pref, your money is still accruing pref. Right. So even, even if the pr property, as you said, sometimes value adds don't realize their value until the sale. But if you if you buy a property for 10 million, you sell it for 20, and you had an 8% prep, you did it in three years, your investors are going to get 24% before you even touch the deal. They're going to be made whole on the prep before the split even starts, okay. which is, I don't want to say the G word because we're trying to say guarantee at, at any time ever, but it's, it's almost as good as a guarantee, assuming the deal does what you expect it to deal to do. So you know, preps can be very, very beneficial. Yeah, yeah. It's also show confidence of the sponsor. If a sponsor is really confident on the deal, give a pref. Yep. If you're not confident, then you can do a straight split, right? So pref uh, means I'm confident I'm good. This is going to make money. Otherwise, I'm not making money, right? So, right. And um, if you're not confident, you shouldn't be doing the deal. Yeah. What's the point, right? Sometimes people say, I just want to try. You know, whatever it is, we're just going to split, right? It's a very easy way to say it, right? So if it if it goes down, we go down together. If it goes up, it goes up together, right? But a really strong sponsor, and this is how I say it, advanced investor, advanced sponsors, how Wall Street of uh, commercial real estate works. It's like they give a pref, right? So, um, and also we talked about alignment of interest just now, but on a pref, we are putting passive investor first. Right. It's not even aligning. We are just putting them right. ahead of this. So would you say you're preferring them? <laughs> yeah, probably. That's why maybe yeah, prefer, so I mean, that, right? That's so. what a that's what a pref is. You're, I mean, you're literally, you're putting the investor in front of the GP Correct. and for passives that are listening, or I hate to use the word passives for, for people that are passively investing that are listening, you know, these can be very good opportunities for you, you know, depending on the deal, they can be very good opportunities. You have to look at the performance of the, of the GP and clearly look at the asset and you and I both like uh, value add. Value add are harder and harder to find, but now you have COVID value add. Mm -hmm. So uh, poor property management right now creates some incredible value add um, deals. But anyway, that's a whole other topic. So, so, I, so where, where it motivates the sponsor to push overall performance. So when you and I are doing prefs with our um, investors on deals, we could not be more motivated to get more money because we're not going to get paid until our investors get their pref paid in full. And so we have to do the best we can or your wife and my wife are gonna be very pissed off at us. Yeah. And it's important, it's, but it's important for passives and investors to understand that in that type of deal that, you know, it's not a heavy front loaded deal. Yeah, you may take an acquisition fee, but uh, I don't see a whole lot of deals where you're taking an acquisition fee, you're taking a due diligence fee, you're taking a, a uh, exit fee or taking a refinance fee. Some do, but, but you can do that on a straight split too, right? So they're doing it on straight splits. Yeah, so yeah everybody does. Not only, yeah, not only they it not doesn't matter. Right? This, yeah, so I mean, in some of these deals, the manager is making far more than the than the passive will ever make, and the manager's using their money to do that. I mean, I guess good for that particular manager, but I can't see that lasting very long. Yeah, so, yeah. talk about the last point. Yeah, so uh, I mean, it's also. Pref structure can be creatively structured, right? While maintaining passive investors, basically, too. because when you say 8% prep or 7% prep, you're saying that fundamentally, I'm going to give you at least 7% or 8% in this deal, right? Which is awesome compared to any other investment outside. And I'm going to make on top of that, right? And, and you know, to push more for, uh, for active investor, you can creatively do more things on the back end, right? So let's go to the next slide. And, and are, we gonna talk, are we going to talk about those more things on the back end? Yeah. Yeah. This, this, we're getting in close to your type of deal. <laughs> yeah. Great. So I want to, uh, I want to, I want to go through this slide. This is completely new material. I have to create this for this uh, presentation. So it doesn't exist anywhere else. Uh, even not even my book that I created this morning. Uh, and so let's look at four different market cycle, right? So market cycle phase one is recovery, right? Phase two is expansion. Phase three is hyper supply. Phase four is recession. We are in a recession right now. Okay, mm -hmm. don't believe anyone who said we are. In a, we are multifamily is still doing very well. I mean, it is still doing very well. It's still holding up, but in general, our economy is in a is in a recession right now. Right. So if you look at, like, if I put straight split and preferred return, it works very well during the phase one recovery and expansion because everybody makes money. You know, fundamentally, everybody gets the 
price return or 80-20 uh, straight split, everybody's making money, right? But but on a hyper supply, when people stop, like right now when COVID hits, a lot of sponsors have stopped paying. They said, okay, we want to reserve the cash, right? But on a straight split, they can do that, right? I mean, I, I have a lot of deals on my straight split too, and I can do that too. I said, I want to reserve my cash, which is good. But if you look at passive investors, they are also not getting anything during this time because right. a straight split is a straight split. There's no promise, no catch up, nothing, right? But on a pref, you have money being uh, accruing. So your money right. so, money is still working for you during down. Right. So in hyper supply and recession, even if the asset is not performing for the next six months, you as an investor that has a pref, you know, you're still accruing, you know, that eight or nine percent. So as we all know, assets, uh, real estate cycles. We're in a down cycle, but it cycles every nine years, 10 years, it cycles. So you're going to hit the upswing and you kind of want to be in a pref in that scenario because you're going to get paid either way upon the sale before your 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 GP is going to get paid. Yep. Absolutely. I, so I, like I mean, graph. yeah, I mean, as I said, now people are realizing right now because a lot of people are not getting paid or any no distribution and you know, that can last for another two years and your money is not working, right? But on a pref, it accrues, right? Until a sale and at least at the sale, the sponsor need to be at least catching you up back to whatever you lost in the year that was not paid off. Uh, you have to catch it up again. Let's Absolutely. go to the next slide and see. So let me give you an example. So on overall deal performance, um, so first earlier we talked about a different economic cycle. Now it's different deal performance. This doesn't matter whether good times, bad times or not. Even good times, even good times, I saw a lot of deals which not doing very well because it was not bought right or the sponsor was not good. But so an example on a deal performance where you know a deal is making 10%, right? Just assume it's 10%, right? But so when you look at straight split, let's say assume 80-20, the passives make more than 8% because the deal is making more than 10%, right? So 80% of 10% is 8%, right? But on a prior return, passive makes at least 8%. Uh, on a deal performing performance where there's a gain of uh, at least 10%, passive make uh, 8%, and on a prior return, passive make at least 8% as well. But if the deal goes south, and making less than 10% for some reason, right? And and there are a lot of deals goes out even during on the you know recovery right. and expansion. Right. Uh, on a straight split, look at that. Passive make less than 8%, right? Because <laughs> there is no uh, pref, right? So it's just whatever you, you're going down with me, I'm going down with you kind of thing. Right, right? So, down with the ship. <laughs> everybody go down to the- James, I'd be willing to bet if we pulled the people on here right now, I would, uh -huh. I would be willing to bet that the majority of people are not seeing 8% returns right now with COVID. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so right. those that are in prefs that have an 8% pref, yeah, they won't see it today, but they're going to see it when it turns around. We all know COVID's going to go away. It's just a matter of time and the economy will build back up. And you'd like to be able to kind of have that that return that's kind of been banked. And so it's, it's, it's essentially, a it's almost like a promise to pay. You're going to get paid before the the GP and, and let's say hypothetically you're you're owed twenty four percent on a three year deal and the deal closes and only pays out twenty two percent. Okay, you're still going to get twenty two percent. GP is going to get nothing. Okay, so you can say the GP sucked, or you can say, man, I really like that GP because he or she or they put themselves behind us, and we know they went through some crap. And that's the other thing, you know investors see what the GPs make and they see how hard the GPs uh, uh, work. And sometimes deals, sometimes deals don't turn out the way anybody had expected or something comes up. So this right here, I'm a big, big, big proponent of prefs. You and I both are. Um, I, I can't emphasize enough how important it is for passives to look at these type of deals. It, it really puts them if not an equal playing field, a, a greater position than the GPs on these deals. Oh, they are greater because they're getting a prep return. Right. So it's, it's not even alignment of interest. This is putting investors first in front of the, before the GP. So let's go to the next one. Um, so this is actually figure 4.6 from my book, uh, which I wrote like almost two years ago, right? So I talked about what are the difference. I mean, I'm trying to be really, really... Um, objective about it, right? So, you know, waterfall structure, which is a basically a pref structures versus a uh, straight split and pros is compensation upfront. I mean, I was thinking that everybody do waterfall 
uh, takes a lot of uh, acquisition fee. But you know, I also realized that even on the straight split, people are doing a lot of acquisition fee. It's nothing yeah. wrong about acquisition fee as long as you can deliver your deal, right? Don't. I mean, the worst thing is you people take a huge ac right. <laughs> acquisition fee and never deliver anything. That's the worst, right? So, and there are a lot of deals like that too, right? So, but. If you take acquisition fee and you give me a pref, okay, now you are confident and and I know my position is protected, right? So, and um, I've, I said, I've seen some four percent acquisition fees recently. Oh yeah, yeah. Can you believe that? Yeah. So you get a thirty million dollar deal and the acquisition fee is one point two million. Unbelievable, and 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 they're able to raise capital, which blows me away. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I wish I could do that. Yeah. So I, here I, I just mentioned about who who. You know what's the benefit for deal sponsor and uh, you know straight split. Sometimes there's no pressure to give profit on day one. Uh, but you know I, even when I wrote the book, I mean when I wrote this content, I was not aware that profit and can be accrued, right? So even though you don't give day one, but can be accrued as well. Right. Um, the cons is like it may take a few years for deal sponsor to receive compensation based on uh, you know amount of work for value at deal, right? So. So James, let me stop you real quick. So yeah. you said something that's very important when you said you wrote the book two years ago. Mm -hmm. that you didn't realize PREF can be accrued. Yeah, I that's didn't know about very, that. <laughs> so that's a very key key statement that you made. It's not mm -hmm. that you didn't realize many, many deals out there that are PREFs are not accruing PREFs. So you want to oh, okay. ask the sponsors whether the PREF is accrued and catches up or whether it's just you get a PREF year one, a PREF year two, a PREF year three. If, if you have an 8% PREF in year two, it only pays out six. Well, you get all 6%, but year three starts all over again. So you don't okay. get that extra 2%. So actually, when you when you wrote this, you were thinking the right thing because okay. there are many deals where there's not a catch up on the pref. So it's very important that you that you either talk to your sponsors, your GPs mm -hmm. and or a lawyer who's reviewing your documents to make sure it's clear as to whether you are getting a catch up or you're not getting a catch up or a crew, as you put it. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, I mean, we are in our own world, we think everything else is bad. But once you talk to people, once you become objective and look at op open, bring down the barrier and you know, look at what exactly is good about it, then, you know, then you realize, oh, okay, this is much better than what I have to do, right? So, and there's pro and cons in both structure, right? So, um, yeah, I think the rest are what we gone, uh, what we just went through right now. And the deal type, you know, you can use both waterfall structure and straight split on both structures, and and um, you know, it works for you know any deep value add call or even yield play or even uh, value add deals, right? So, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so this is a structure that I I came up with after cracking my head. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and I mean, it's, it's not like I came up with this. I mean, I already know some people are already doing it outside in the market, but I was really analyzing because I was doing a lot of straight split and a lot of my investors are used to straight split as well. And, and there's, there's people who are invested straight split throughout their whole life. They have in, invested millions of dollars when they call me, James, why are you doing this, right? So then when I explained to them, they say, wow, that's much better structure than straight split, right? So, so this is a structure where, you know, covers, you know, you know, the three things that we talked about, right? First of all, it's like, you know, you can, so if you look at here, there's three types of level, the three classes. One's called a PREF equity, where there's PREF return of 10%, but you don't get paid anything on the back end, right? So this, you know, these three classes actually covers for different types of investor base. One who love cash flow, uh, the other one who loves the back end upside, where it gets higher return, but willing to take more risk. The last one, uh, common equity uh, for 500,000 minimum here, they are basically for fund to fund or LLCs equity, right? But, but the first two are the big one uh, that I think I want to make sure that everybody understands. So you, there is a pref in between, and the first one, even though ten percent return, no back and upside, but they get paid first. After the lender get paid, they are the one who get paid. So their risk is really really low. So it, that's important. I'm, I'm working on a, a fund right now in Houston, and ours is structured very similar. We actually have mm -hmm. four classes, not counting the GP, mm -hmm. but it's very very important again it's about pronouns i mean prepositions excuse me not pronouns prepositions as to a pref you can have several classes with prefs but you need to understand are they peri pursu which means there's ten thousand dollars and you have a nine percent eight percent and seven percent pref for each respective class and they could share equally in that until their buckets are full or are they not peri pursue and there's a priority? And I think in your scenario, A1 preferred equity is actually a priority. I think you, like we, and correct me if I'm wrong, 
you're paying the 10 percent before a2 or a3 even get paid. yeah yeah a1 okay. get paid first so yeah if you see that and a priority so you can't be you know some people listening may poo poo oh you know what nothing on the back end i'm in a couple of deals right now where i wish i had an a1 10 percent uh uh preferred equity because I don't see a whole lot on the back end because the deals weren't managed the way I had expected them to be managed. Right. And so they haven't attained the value that I would have expected. Um, but I typical, uh, 85, 15 split, but it's very important to note that it's not just a pref, it's also a priority. So it's one thing to say, you know, everybody gets a pref, but many people's funds I'm speaking out of experience because we draft these for hundreds of people. Um, the 10, eight, nine, in many cases are peri pursu. So a dollar comes in and it's pro rata to A1, A2, A3. In your deal and my deal, a dollar comes in, it goes straight to A1 until A1's 10% bucket is filled. Then A2 and A3, you know, they get their money. And, and I think that's important for people to understand that. Yeah, yeah. It works out well with, with the deal. I mean, all types of deal. I mean, even the deal that I recently did, I mean, my first year was like one or 2% return. I mean, on a straight split, that kind of deal may not be interesting for people. But when I say, hey, you have a pref, even though I'm giving you one or 2%, but you still have another, you know, 6%, you know, coming later, it's going to be accrued somewhere. So people are, yeah, fine with that. No problem. Right. But on a straight split, you can't do that, right? Because you said, you know, let's, you know, either we go up together or we go down together on a straight right. split. <laughs> An 80-20 split of zero is still zero. <laughs> correct, correct. So uh, this is the deal that we put in, uh, you know, where, you know, uh, I think this kind of uh, a different structure where it, it matches investor preference and putting a pref, uh, you know, with a backend upside. Like here, you know, people talk about, um, I think, uh, yeah, we talked about 70-30 GP split. People said, hey, you are taking a lot of money, 70-30. But then I said, I'm giving you a pref. I'm promising you at least an eight percent. Whereas on the 80-20, there is no, there is not say promising. I'm, I'm, I'm not even I'm giving, not even you, a giving pref, you a pref, right? <laughs> so, right? So, so it really pushes the sponsor to focus a lot on improving the deal to and totality because you're going to make money on the back end, right? Or on a refi, right? So you're going to make money on that. But at the same time, it's protecting the passive investor interests by at least putting a pref over there. So there's a fundamental basic return that the passive investors will get from this deal, even before the sponsor gets it, right? So, so this is a structure we put in, a lot of people love it. As I said, you know, there was a lot of uh, interest in the deal and people who are used to straight split, when I explained to them about the pref, they said, oh, okay, that's better. That's better than, you know, the straight split, right? Because people want to make sure that their money works, right? right. And, and if you look at, like for example, Warren Buffer, right? I mean, how has he become a billionaire? If you look at the past 20 years, his money has been working at least 20% IRR every year. And so you, and some year, of course, it doesn't work as much as 20%, it goes to 9%, but at least the money need to continue working, right? If it stopped working, like right now, let's for example, COVID doesn't work for next two, I mean, something happened, COVID continues and nobody paying up for next two years, your money is actually losing money, right? Because you're not working at all, right? So, here, here's an interesting um, concept, and I think a lot of syndicators don't get it, and, and you and I are completely aligned. Mm -hmm. um, A3. So I don't even care if it's fund to funds. It could be somebody that has half a million dollars. It's a very high net worth individual. So I'm of the belief, and, and I'm probably going to say it um, politically incorrectly, which wouldn't be the first time I say something that's politically incorrect, but I prefer someone coming in with half a million or a million dollars. I will pay them more because they shut up. They do the deal. They've got lots of money. They just want to see a check every month or every quarter and they leave me alone versus ten hundred thousand dollar investors who have lots of questions and don't necessarily read everything that's sent out to them. So for me, I try to reward those that put larger sums of money into my deal, it makes my life easier. I'll give up a percent like you see here, or even a little bit better split to someone that comes in with more money. And in an open fund where I'm raising money over a period of time, I will give a either a greater pref or a greater split to those that come in on day one that trusted me and the process versus those that come in next year after I've already picked up a couple assets 
you know, that's great. They like the deal, but they're not coming in at a 90, 10 split. They're coming in at a 70, 30 split. You know, these other guys that they, 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 they believed in me and what we were doing and you guys are waiting to see if we actually did it. So your risk has been mitigated. So because your risk is mitigated, guess what? Your return is mitigated. You didn't have the same risk, but I really like a three and that's exactly the way we structured our last deal. Um, we used a 400 K mark, but it doesn't really matter. You're rewarding those that come in, whether it's fund to funds, a family office, a high net worth individual. Um, you really want those investors. Now they're unicorns. Um, you don't always get them, but if they're coming, it, it starts reducing, you know, the amount of uh, 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 splits you have. You, I personally would rather have four or five investors than 96 investors. Uh, it doesn't work that way all the time. But anyway, I don't want to go too much into fund of funds. Hmm. There's, there are legal issues surrounding fund of funds that, I, that some people do it the right way, some people do it the wrong way. So we're not here to talk about it. But I think the point is, and you and I have talked at length about them, um, and I've got one of those in our latest deal in Houston. It, they're, they're very lucrative. Um, and, it, you know, if you step back and you look at this, this whole presentation, the bottom line is you've made it very simple here in the structure. I don't mean it's a simple structure, but you've made it very easy to understand. You've, you're targeting three separate types of investors here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Typical deal, typical person listening here is targeting one type of investor. And so what you've just done is, and I think I started off at the beginning by saying, this is the busiest quarter I think I've ever seen. Not necessarily for legal work. I'm still catching up from Q2 and Q3 of nothing, but you've got Freddie that is not taking any more loans. You've got Fannie that's not taking any more loans for the rest of the year. It is the busiest quarter anybody's ever seen. And because it's the busiest quarter, guess what? You, me, and every uh, body listening in right now, we're all fighting for capital. And so not necessarily having to cut deals, but you need to make your deal look very lucrative to the capital that's out there because it's unique for uh, capital out there right now for passives. Passives have a choice. They have lots of choices. You know, we're at the end of the year, people are trying to get depreciation expense, blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what? There are a lot of opportunities out there. And in the past, while Q4 is busy, it's never been like this. So people have lots of opportunities. And one of the things I always tell people in everything is be patient. Look at the deal, wait for the type of deal you like, because if you're, you have one of three types of investors here and one of these types of investors, all three of these are represented on this call. I'm not saying they're investing with me, but I, I guarantee you they're all three represented. This appeals to everybody. It's not just one investor. It's not just a, a club investor or a New York investor. It appeals to everybody. Well, I, had, I had three people who wanted to invest in A3, but it was a bit too late because we were like over, already oversubscribed. Send them to me. Just <laughs> but then people did say, hey, I want to put, you know, 500,000. <laughs> I'll take them. It's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll help you out. I'll take them. Yeah. So are you done with this slide? Yeah, yeah. I think that's, uh, this is a slide. Oh my and, God. Well, let yeah. me go and, back. and also the last point I made is prefer returns always based on the remaining money that's remain in the deal, right? So if if fifty percent of the money is uh, given back, so the prefer returns on the remaining fifty percent, right? So, right. So one of the things, and and so that what you just saw, and I, James, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's your last deal. Yeah, yeah, that's the deal that we closed it. yesterday. Yes. So James and I are kind of lifting up the kimonos and kind of showing what we do for those of you that haven't invested with us, and in and. and I'm not promoting my deal by any means, but we have a deal in Katy, Texas, and we just structured a four class deal. Um, I, it's a, I prefer three, but we structured a four. It's pretty funny. It is almost identical. James and I talked about it, uh, I think a week and a half ago when I asked you if you would uh, come on and talk. And so it's the exact same thing. We have a 10% pref. It is priority pref. And it's interesting, the people that are looking at it are older, I would say in their 60s, we poll our investors. So in order for them to invest, they've got to go through a whole questionnaire, not an investor questionnaire. Just, by uh, the Just to cut off, I had a CPA who invested in that class, big money. Right. He said, I'm well, going to do it. I mean, if a CPA doesn't know what he's 
doing that's 10 percent you know every right. year right so right and so cpas are very risk adverse that's their nature they're b type people they're risk adverse why would you not try to target 10 15 20 cpas or even doctors who don't understand business and they just understand okay if I put money in, I get a return, I'm ahead of everybody else, and I get paid before anybody else. Okay, that's not necessarily a bad deal versus, okay, if the asset does really well, I get a windfall, but if the asset doesn't do very well, eh, I don't make so much. That's the younger people. You know, I'm probably in the middle. You're younger. I'm in the 50s, very, very low 50s, like 51. But so I'm not ready for the 10%. But I'll tell you, there's a part of me after this year where 10% doesn't look that bad on a couple of my deals. I would take 10% uh, had I knew, uh, had I known uh, a year and a half ago that we'd be in this kind of COVID world right now, but nobody could have done that. But I think it's very key that people take their time. They ask questions. You don't have to be, and it's not um, accusatory and it's not uh, confrontational to ask your GP questions. I think your GP would want to know that you're interested in how the deal is structured and nothing is worse as being a GP when people ask questions after they've already invested and you realize they don't know what they invested in. They don't know what the classes even represent. So as you know, both of us, our jobs are to really educate people when we do our presentations on the funds. The asset is one thing. But I, I might argue on something like this, the structures we do, it's at least 50% of explaining the different options people have. And you may have had this too. I've had people that will invest a portion of money in one and then also take a unit in the 10 in the 10% because in their minds, it kind of evens them out. You know, it balances the, the risk, right? That they, they, they get right. with the return. Right. It's the, uh, it's the, I'm putting everybody back on a regular view. Yeah, it, it, you know, you would argue that it, it balances out your risk. Um, so before we take questions, and I'm sure there are some questions. Um, James, you and I are talking about value add deals. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think we've had a couple, I wouldn't say arguments, but discussions on, on whether they're there or not. My argument is, or my argument, my position is, we're coming off of a, a market where the val many of the value add deals have just been scooped up. People got very lucky uh, with uh, compressed uh, cap rates and they did very well, but the value adds are harder to find. And I mean, value adds by this is a dump that's in a good area and I need to put in, you know, seven to 10 grand a door versus this is a deal where it's been rehabbed it's, it's market uh, appearance, but the property management has suffered tremendously during COVID, didn't know what they were doing, and they're at 81% or 82% occupancy. So from my position, that's a value add because- Oh yeah, management plays are absolutely a value right. add. And that's the easiest thing to increase the value in. We all know if, if it was doing 92 to 95% pre-COVID, and now you're in COVID and it's doing 82, that's very easy to explain. That should be very easy to explain to investors. The investors don't understand that. You don't want them as investors. Um, that's like a home run if you can find it. Uh, and I know you and I are looking hard for those uh, <laughs> those nuggets out there. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, the one I'm closing, uh, I mean, the one I closed yesterday is a forbearance deal. I mean, that's like nobody have been paying, not say nobody, I mean, this. I think like 20% of the people not paying any rent because they know it's, the whole uh, deal is in forbearance, right? So then, so now right. today we go and tomorrow we're going to start telling them, hey, you know, you it's no more in forbearance, you have to pay. So right. It's a good surprise for them. Watch, watch Q2, Q3. I keep telling everybody on the single family, we did a ton of single family over the last six years. The market is gearing up for a huge dump mm -hmm. of single family out there. They're at 9% um, uh, default rate. It's been holding at 9%. Everybody's getting forbearance. And I don't care who's in office. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. The banks are going to shed some of this debt. They have to. They're not going to go through what they did before. So there's going to be, just like you're going to see it in single family, you're going to see it in multifamily. But I think the interesting thing is people are going to have to decide, do they want to go after these deals in Florida or, you know, uh, Georgia or um, Las Vegas. You know, 
Las Ve yeah, Las Vegas. So Las Vegas and Phoenix. People think, oh, Phoenix, it's the best market ever. Look at the look at the returns. Okay. And and I'm a big proponent of Phoenix. So I'm not dissing Phoenix MSA, but I was also a hard money lender in the 2008 through 2012. And let me tell you, the property prices uh, in Phoenix for single family dropped by 70% in many of the areas. So to say that the values have increased, yeah, they increased from their very low, which was 60 to 70% below what they initially priced. They overbuilt Phoenix right before the market tanked. And so the worst thing could happen is you overbuilt with the expectation of people coming and the market tanks. Vegas is Vegas. They're building it, but you know, when you have COVID, it just destroys. It's like Orlando. It has a massive impact when the majority of your, you know, your business, your GDP is is based upon tourism. Uh, I can speak personally on New Orleans, where I had a daughter that went to Tulane, and the city of New Orleans has absolutely been decimated. It was a hope nobody hears from New Orleans. It was a shithole to begin with. Uh, with the hurricanes and everything, but the tourism kept it alive. You cut out tourism, I can promise you that very few people on this uh, website right now that would actually walk in the French Quarter right now in New Orleans. We did, and it scared my wife. We were shocked um, that, that one, there was nobody there. Everything was boarded up. It's unbelievable. So I think one of the things to remind people, we kind of are in a bubble in Texas. Um, it's a very good bubble. I don't think it's a made belief makeup uh, made up bubble. I think the economy is strong here. I think people are moving here. Jobs are here. Um, people are careful when it comes to COVID, but not uh, freaky. And I say that, and I'm now in 14 day quarantine because my daughter was just tested positive with COVID. But um, I'm still able to do this show, yeah. uh, and I'm not infecting anybody while I'm doing it. I tested negative. Not that anybody cares, but uh, my team cares. I'm still here, team. Um, and James cares, but I, there are great opportunities out there right now. Great, great opportunities. We picked up one pre COVID. It was listed at 44 million. Um, and we picked up for 36.25. Okay. They're not all deals like that, but they're deals out there and they're great deals, especially if they're off market. James, I'm assuming yours was off market. Yeah. Off market. Yeah. The off market, um, are incredible deals. And one of the things that I, tell people and we get a lot of new people that are calling don't be afraid to get a deal there are at least 80 or 90 people sitting here listening right now that would love to partner with someone that can find the deal but isn't able to necessarily operate it by themselves you know i i there's a whole podcast and a whole uh, not podcast but a whole show on on our um uh youtube that says how to pick the right partner picking the right partner is like picking the right wife it's sometimes more important um, not that picking your wife is not important, but uh, uh, it's very important. But there are plenty of people on here. I can just see the faces that I know would do deals. If you're the guy that actually or gal that actually locks in on a deal, but then you're like, oh, shit, how the hell am I going to raise $13 million? Talk to James. James might be interested in that <laughs> type of deal. I'm not saying he is, but yeah, James, might, yeah, James might want a partner absolutely. on that type of deal if it's a value add deal. And it's not just James. It's it's Jefferson, it's Malay, it's uh, Jim. I'm just calling out names just, uh, and I'm sure it's David, but David's not allowed to partner with, Slava's not allowed to partner with anybody but me. Um, I see him smiling in his game chair uh, at the bottom. But uh, um, I just, I, I wanna encourage people to continue to go after deals. I highly recommend you read James's uh, book. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not a big fan of books and a little tidbit, I actually was one of the first people probably in this entire group that had a book published on Amazon. Jeff actually helped me publish it on Amazon. Jeff, do you remember that? Hard Money Made Easy? I do. I think it's still on there somewhere. It's still on there. And if any of you buy it, I'm going to shoot you because it was written in a different way a long, long time ago. You guys think I'm a smart ass now? I was well, a it's in some person. account that you don't have access to anymore. Right. So I'm apparently still making royalties on the book, but I have no idea how to access it or what bank account it even uh, uh, is on. Um, Texas lost I, money. I'm pretty sure I beat James on sales, but I'm not going to argue with him. It's been out there since 2008. So James, I have a little heads up on you. Oh, uh, yeah. A little running running room on you. My but class, yeah. It's Cindy, you yeah, you're, you're right there. Cindy, do we have any questions? Were there any questions that you saw? 
There's a couple of on here. But someone, James, asked, what other fees do you take um, aside from an acquisition fee? So we do the asset management fee 2%. Uh, we have our own property management 3%. And uh, usually we do buy a broker fee because we find a lot of uh, off-market deals ourselves. Uh, could be like 1% to 2%. That's it, right? So uh, very simple and lean and mean. Sounds good. Um, do you prefer to distribute monthly or quarterly? We usually like to do quarterly, but we are, once the property stabilized, we like to go to monthly, right? I mean, I, I do not know how people can pay monthly from day one. Mm -hmm. There's no it's way tough. on a cap rate, on a, on a leverage that people do, there's nobody can pay 8% prep on a day one. The only way they do it is create a separate account and just paying out from there. It's not from real estate. Right? And I do like to do that. I like to create money, take money from real estate and pay the investors, even though it doesn't look cool. Right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we, we, we are only, we, all our money comes from real estate. So you, know, you, you have to wait on a quarterly basis. Once we stabilize, we are moving to monthly. James, you must have a good CPA. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. He's from Dallas. <laughs> do, I, do I have a good CPA, Cindy? Yes, you do. T Tandy down there, who's laughing. Tandy's our CPA, and uh, okay. and um, so it's so I'm I'm probably one of the few. I'm different, so I'm I'm one of those. If you build it, they will come, and there are others have them come, and then I will expand. So I have always wanted to invest in incredible people and hire people much smarter than me. That's why you guys work with Cindy and not me, and Greg and not me, and. Jeff and Rob and not me. I just, um, I'm in the back. I, I know how to hire people, but I don't know how to do anything else. But you, you hire a team so that, you know, like when you're at James's level and you've got, you know, $28 billion in properties, um, I'm kidding, 130 million or whatever, whatever the number is, he's at a big number right now. Um, you, it's not a one person shop. And you need to make sure not only do you have a team, you have a team that's going to last you don't want to just have somebody then they go away and find somebody else and go away. It is a nightmare. It's like trying to find a new lawyer. Um, lawyers are, are assholes to begin with. So it's once you find the one that's the least asshole or someone nice and smart, like Greg or Cindy, you know, then you've got it made. Um, Cindy, were there any other questions you had? Uh, let's oh, see. How does the ref work with a refi? If the property is refied and the new amount is on a higher value, should the PREF be paid first before the money goes to the rehab or GP? Yeah, the way I've structured is PREF is always paid on the remaining money, right? So, you know, you still get 8% PREF on whatever remaining money that's left. And on top of that, you split, you know, 70, 30 or 80, 20 or whatever. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's almost like, uh, James, it's almost like we should build a... Um, uh, a little spreadsheet mm -hmm. to show people kind of real life examples. Maybe you and I can put something together and we can send it out to, uh, yeah. Yeah. to this group because they have good questions. And, you know, we spent just a short period of time going over it, but these are, these are key. And I'm just looking through, there are a lot of people here that are syndicators. And uh, I think this is, you know, again, I'm going to, I'm going to qualify this with make sure if you're in a, an investment club or group, this doesn't violate your investment club or groups um, kind of rules because they have certain parameters. They'd like their investments to, to be their syndicators to be uh, structuring their deals. For those of you that aren't or, or don't have those requirements, these are very lucrative. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of David. He and I have done several uh, already like this, uh, David down there in the gaming chair uh, with the um, uh, air traffic control headphones. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I'm not going to Well, I had, uh, there is one question that was uh, sent to me. Uh, someone wants to know why 1030, uh, 1031 component is never offered in syndication. Oh, it is offered, right? I think there are some people who are offering that. There's um, some. If it's a big money, yes, we can offer it because you can always structure the 1031 as a, as a partner on a thick model plus with the syndication, right? So it might need to be a big money because there's a lot more paperwork and all kind of complication comes in. Like Jeff, this. unmute uh, Greg. Greg wants to say something. Oh, yeah, I would. Yeah, no, it, 
to stay away from ticks if at all possible, uh, unless it's a huge capital partner that you're really trying to appease, uh, be very weary of, of, of ticks. So my, my, my discussion, you guys have heard me probably 10 times, those of you that haven't. So t think of a tick like a marriage um, because everything is kind of community property. There's no special division, but the problem with ticks is they're even a higher rate of divorce in ticks than there is in marriage. And I think the latest numbers with COVID is it's about a 55% divorce rate. I would say ticks divorce rate is much higher than that. And the litigation is great for litigation lawyers and horrible for tick members. So the deal with ticks is when they work, they're really, really good. And when they don't work, they're really, really bad. I don't know anybody that has just done a tick and said, eh, it was okay. Um, it, either, it either is a home run or you end up suing each other because you can't stand each other and there's no way to get each other out. But I agree with James, you know, if a tick comes in with four or $5 million or a, a 1031, you may try to figure out a way to structure that, but make sure you have numerous exit strategies and ways to, to bring that capital back in if the tick dissolves. Yeah. Yeah. I had an investor ask me to invest uh, 900,000 in, in the race that I did. But by the time, I mean, we, we need to raise like seven and a half million, but so I said 900,000 is too small for, for me to go through the entire, pro unless I can't raise the money, then I can right. the structure. Right. So it's too small until it's not too small. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah <laughs> right, right. But that That's was a big uh, amount from take uh, that 1031 uh, money that wanted to come in. So um, I think that's, Cindy, anything else? No, you're good. So if anybody has questions, you guys are welcome to uh, shoot me an email. So what we're gonna do, as we always do, is we're going to um, make this available with the PowerPoint. Um, all of James's information will be sent to everybody. Um, and I think a link to your book, right, James? He's on mute, Jeff. On mute. I think I gave the link to uh, you, Jeff, and right. you guys can send that out. Yeah. So they'll have that tomorrow. And then that way, if you guys have any questions, um, you can email James directly too. And, and again, I want to sure. thank James a lot for, uh, for being on this and driving all the way from his kitchen to his study, <laughs> his house. Yeah. Well, I'm just happy because sometimes uh, people don't explain things very well. And sometimes you are in a cocoon and you think, I mean, as I said, right, when I was writing my book, I was thinking perhaps return doesn't uh, accrue. And now I realize sometimes it accrues, sometimes it doesn't accrue, right? So you always have to just expand your you know, knowledge. You're talking to different people and just talk and make your right decision, right? I mean, this is a free will, right? So Awesome. Okay, everybody, please take care. Um, sorry, I won't see any of you guys in person for 13 more days, but uh, it is what it is. My wife is yelling at me. David, don't <laughs> shake your head at me. Um, <laughs> my child who doesn't go out and doesn't see anybody is the one who got COVID, which is unbelievable. Um, the rest of us who go out more and I'm at the club and working and stuff like that, you know, we get nothing. And then Jeff goes and gets tested too, right, Jeff? <laughs> so yeah, by the way, so, the, experience. so the see, testing, you, you, immunity drops when you just stay at home, right? That's right, right, right. So the testing was very interesting. So my wife and I, we tried six different places. They, it's scary. Everybody's booked solid right now. So obviously testing or cases are up. I don't know if death rates up, but cases are up. Um, so it went from, we found a place that you don't need reservations to, this is not me, this is my wife. How long is the stick that's going up your nose? So I'm like, are you kidding me? We finally found two places. No, I want you to ask, how long is that stick that's going up? Because if it's touching my brain, I'm not going to do it. And I'm like, I, I, I'm telling her, okay, so our child's doctor said we should go get tested to see if we have COVID. So then we go there and it's funny. It wasn't the short stick and it wasn't the long stick. It was a medium stick. <laughs> and it was pretty cool. I mean, if you think about it, it was really cool. So we go up, you don't make a reservation. We basically just pulled up in this parking lot, uh, Baylor, it was part of Baylor uh, Frisco. And basically you go online and you just type in your information. We paid, I think $85 a piece for the test and you stay in your car, you turn on your blinkers, your hazards, they show up knowing that you've told them, okay, I paid for my test. 
and then they have a swab and it's about the stick is like this high which scared me but the swab part is like this and i jeff probably had a different experience than i did but they stick it up your nose and of course they've got to do both nostrils so you know you're getting used to the first the second one i wanted to sneeze twice when she did it 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 actually tickled my nose um and then you sit there and you wait for 15 minutes and they come right back to your car and they give you your results and you go on your way and so it was i gotta tell you it was fascinating to see how quickly it was it was a little disturbing to see how many cars were waiting because we drive by this place every single day. And last week, I don't remember ever seeing a single car there. So I don't know what's going on. And again, there are people like myself that has a daughter that gets tested positive and the three of us go get tested and we're negative. So I don't know how contagious it really is or how accurate the tests are. You guys have seen me post. I was with my daughter nonstop for the last five days and she had been complaining about you know, allergies, allergies, allergies. Well, they weren't allergies. Um, but for the, the young people, she had a sore throat, a little bit of a sore throat and a fever of 100 yesterday. Fever's gone. Sore throat's mostly gone. The doctor prescribed zinc, lots of zinc. And he said, if you could get hydroxychloroquine, take it. And here's the prescription. If not, just take Dayquil or Nyquil if it gets worse, but she's already on the upside. So anyway, please be safe. Um, and uh, it's it's out there, but uh, it doesn't seem to be as potent as it was before. And I want to thank everybody. Thanks, James, Cindy, Greg, Jeff, everybody, uh, especially Ed, who has had enough time to uh, text me on 15 different social medias now. Um, everybody have a good evening and uh, let's go get some more deals. Bye, guys. Bye.